Okay, so we're ready to start working with Azure, right? That's the whole idea here. So first of all, you'd have to have a, an account, right? So through the Imagine subscription service, you can get a, an account to use Azure. Uh, you'll need two things, okay? You have to have two accounts to use. You have to have your college email, but the truth is that's only used to verify that you're a student, right? To actually do all the work in Azure and in Visual Studio, you need a Microsoft account. Most people have one. Not everybody. Okay? Some people have just never bothered with one before, but if you have an old Hotmail account or anything like that, that would actually work. However, for years now, I've recommended to just create a new one. Fortunately, Microsoft is not stingy about that. They don't let you limit you to how many email accounts you can have, right? Or Microsoft accounts. I've got like a dozen. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's probably still a good idea, not as important as it used to be, but it's probably a good idea just to go out and create a new one that you'll use for this purpose throughout the rest of your time as a student, right? So I suggest just going to like to outlook.com, just create new, right? Uh, you know, it asks for these days, they all ask for things like a phone uh, cell number that they can send text messages to to verify and things like that. So you might just set all that up and away you go, right? So it's actually that Microsoft account that you're gonna use for Azure itself. It's just, as you go through the process and verify, you have to use your student email address to do so. And that's in that video that's already up on YouTube, okay? All right. Okay. So the college account is just to verify the student status, which I believe, I mean, they just rolled this out this fall. So what I understand is you just have to do that once a year, re-verify that you're still a student. And there's the video up there. All right, so first of all, kind of jumping ahead, what is Azure? Well, it's really Microsoft's cloud service, right? And it's huge, and it's growing bigger all the time. It's just about every week or two, it seems, I get an email about some new service they're rolling out in Azure. And I'll be honest, Azure is hugely successful for Microsoft. It's the main reason why Microsoft stock in the stock market has just been going up and up and up, right? Uh, they're becoming a real competitor to the other big names out there, Amazon and, and so on and so forth, that offer uh, web services. Anyway, um, yeah, so it's really big, but we're going to just focus on publishing our database-driven web apps for now, right? And that's something fully covered under the Imagine account. Even with, with the older DreamSpark, they only had MySQL and so on. They didn't even support under this free arrangement for students SQL Server, but now they do, right? So that's a very good thing for us, right? Now there's lots of ways to get it up and running. In fact, there's probably more than a dozen and different tutorials will show you different approaches. Uh, you can actually, you know, get your code up in GitHub or some other code repository and publish directly to Azure from there. Uh, you can go into Azure and create virtually everything, even the application, download it as a Visual Studio file into team services, you know, there's so many variations. And most of the tutorials will actually take you off just doing it all from inside Visual Studio. You don't even have to go into the Azure portal, you can do it right from Visual Studio. And I've done that many times and it works, it works pretty well. However, every once in a while, something seems to go a little bit wrong doing that approach. And issues, as I say here, are often related to just getting the the migrations and the code first approach, the getting the database set up and going properly. Whenever students have trouble, it's almost always related to that. So experience over the last number of years helping students when they get into trouble has kind of helped me work out a bit of a recipe. Okay, it's a little more step by step rather than the direct wizard in Visual Studio, but it has some advantages as well because you set up your access to your SQL Server online and so on at the same time. So I suggest you might want to follow my recipe that never fails. I say that with quotes around never because we should never say never, right? I mean, it hasn't failed me yet, let me put it that way. All right? Okay, so following this along then, step one, go into Azure itself and create the database, right? We know we're going to need a database, so we go to portal.azure.com, log in. Again, it's with this Microsoft account. So I have one. It's the same one that you'll see me creating inside that video that I posted, right? And then we'll create a SQL Server database and we actually have to create a server as part of that process. We have to have a server to host the database, right? 
and uh, we'll be careful where we create it. We'll see about resource groups. And a note there, make note of the admin account, username and password that we set up as well. Okay, so I'm going to stop this for the moment. Let's go to Azure. Doesn't matter which one I use here. Uh, I'll just create a new tab. Actually, just so I don't get confused, I'm going to use a different browser. Portal.azure.com. Okay, so I'll sign in with my demo student. That's the one you see me create in the video. By the way, this actually uh, demo student and see the Niagara College account has already been removed. It's not there. They just gave it to me temporarily so I could get this set up. And then my password. Hang on one second. I just a bit of a funny story. I. Uh, created a really simple password at first and it's the first time I've seen it but it actually came up when I went to log in saying your password is too easy to guess <laughs> you have to make a harder password and it's the first time I've actually had that happen but I said okay that's fine I'll make a harder password all right so here I am uh, okay I thought I deleted everything oh I think it is deleted not found right okay good all right so here's now I could spend a lot of time touring through this, but there are online you know, tours available in Azure anyway, so I'm not going to do that so much as show you what we have, right? Right now I have, under all resources, I have a couple other things up there for a different purpose, uh, but that's okay. I can create new, right? So if I go into new, what I'm going to do is make my new <coughs> database. Now you'll see how some things are grayed out and some are available. Um, most things seem grayed out. Don't always believe it. Don't always believe it. For example, SQL Database. Actually, I put a ticket in to Microsoft about this issue, but it hasn't changed yet. Um, it actually is available, even though it shows it grayed out, because it wasn't there at first under the student accounts, but it is now. So I'm going to add a SQL Database, right? Now we have to give a name to the SQL Database. So I, what I did is I've already downloaded the last version of our medical office example right from Blackboard. So I'm going to publish that up here, right? So for the database, I might just call it med office db. I often use the last couple letters to indicate the type of object I'm making up here. So it's under my Microsoft Imagine subscription. By the way, you can add additional subscriptions under your account. And that's what eventually a lot of students end up doing is if they are trying to make a little money on the side, uh, they might want to be able to use services that aren't available in the free tier. Right? So they'll add what they call a pay-as-you-go account. Where you just you have to give a credit card, right? And then you know you can move services back and forth between subscriptions. So if you want to scale up, you know, the computing power behind a given application or something, you can switch it over to your pay as you go account. And when you're not using it, switch it back into the free one, right? Anyway, so I just have one subscription here right now. I'll have to create a new resource group. Oh, what is a resource group? All it is is just a name to give a collection of different resources you create. It's just a convenience because that way when you, as I just mentioned, move or possibly even delete, right, you can do it as a whole group of things instead of having to go in one at a time and deleting them separately, right? So that's all a resource group is. It seems to be confusing at first for a lot of people. So don't be too concerned about it. RG, resource group. So I'll start with a blank database. Now, here's one of the tricks, right? On the free tier, you're only allowed one free database in a region. You catch that? In a region, right? So I already have one in Canada Central, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new server, but I'll just do it in a different region. <laughs> there you go. So I'll, I'll give it a name, uh, med office, uh, SQL, right? Just for... And notice that this actually becomes let me, uh, a URL, right? It, it'll be that dot database dot windows dot net, and I'll be able to connect to that from anywhere through Management Studio, for example, right? Okay. Now you have to make a login, right? And you have to make a password. So use something you will remember, 
or make note of it. Open Notepad right now, type of thing, and you know, type this in there and save it somewhere, nice and safe and secure, right? Um, I think I'll remember that one. Okay. Now here, so here's the kicker. I couldn't select Canada Central, or I'll be just told again, you only get one free database in a region, right? So, but Canada East should work just fine, okay? And I'll just select that. Uh, I'll tell you, I had the experience once because I was in a hurry and not careful. Uh, I put up a web app a couple years ago where the database accidentally created in Vietnam. And the web app, this was actually before they even had data centers in Canada, uh, the web app itself was hosted in Eastern US, right? And the thing worked. You know, I could insert records, update, delete, and, you know, it actually wasn't bad at all. <laughs> but it improved. When I got went back in and moved the database into the same data center, <laughs> U.S. East, I did notice it got a little bit faster, right? So, yeah, some common sense there does help. Okay, so that's it. So now I have my, uh, my server set up, pricing tier free. That's all you get is this one choice in which you're going to pay money. And the coalition... Uh, that's just, you know, your rules for language, alphabetical sorting, and things like that. So I'll pin that to the dashboard and click Create. Okay. So we'll see it's creating here. Now, it actually takes a little while to deploy. It can take a minute or two, right? So while that's happening, we can just go to the uh, PowerPoint again and just carry on a little bit. Okay. So that's where we left off with step one. So just to talk about... Oh! Sorry, actually, there's a couple more points on here. I almost forgot. Okay, firewall rules. That'll take a little bit of explaining. Obviously, this is a what it's doing, why it's taking some time, is actually spinning up a virtual machine, right, where it's going to then install SQL Server and then create the database for us and everything, right? Now, that virtual machine, that server that's up there in the cloud, right, uh, it has its own firewall protecting it from attacks from the outside. So if we want to be able to connect to it and work with it, we have to open up some IP addresses, at least one, the one that I'm working from, right? So that's where this next point, point three, is create firewall rules to allow access, right? Now, obviously here at the college, you want to be able to access it, but you can also add a rule for your home and, and so on and so forth. One nice thing about the college is to the outside world, I don't know about the whole college, but at least this campus, seems to have one IP address to the outside world. So we just have to enter one rule, and it doesn't matter what lab you're working in, it'll, it'll let you have access to your database server. Okay? And then you can add additional rules for other locations that you want to use. Don't go hog wild. I mean, the more holes you punch in the firewall, the greater the risk of being hacked and things like that, right? But it's, it's not a huge risk, you know, so just add what you need to. Okay, so let me go back, see if, how we're doing. Oh, still deploying. Should be done any moment, though. All right. So I'll just say the last thing we'll do once we create the firewall rule is the connection string, right? I'll show you where we can grab the connection string. I usually do save this somewhere in Notepad or something like that just to have a copy of it because we're going to use it in our actual Visual Studio in our web application in the web config file, right? Okay, let's just see. Oh, not done yet. Boy, that's unusually long. Okay, well, while that's still baking, okay, let me come back to Visual Studio, and we'll just talk a bit about the connection strings here. Remember, these are in web config, right? So right in here, here I have my connection string section. I have two different connection strings. Uh, actually, I should fix this right now because I haven't used, this is the one used by the security system, right, our, the, which we're soon going to get to. Uh, right now, I never did change it, so it's actually uh, pointing to a different database, right? This is that full name that it generated automatically when I created the project. So it really should match this one. So I'm just going to fix that quickly because I've decided I want to save both my production table, so to speak, right, and my security tables in the same database. Uh, it's a reasonable approach. For one thing, it, then you can actually access the tables in the same database quite easily if you ever need to pull information out of the user table, for example. And the other aspect why it's good is we only get so many free databases, right? So I don't want to have two separate databases, one for security and one for uh, my production tables. 
in the real world you might do that um, if you have a need for maybe you have multiple web applications with a common set of user logins right so you can have that one database sit on its own maintaining all the security aspects and then you have multiple applications that are relying on the security from the one right so that's another reason why you might have them in separate but that's a little thing I never got around to changing so at least now they're the same so I'll just save that change the other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to copy these two connection strings and I'll do two things oh I don't have my text editor options showing up here so I'm going to comment them out right but I did copy them already so I pasted a second copy so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this set and I'm going to replace the actual connection string inside here with the one I'm going to get from Azure ah. okay now notice that I don't change the provider name is still the same because whether I'm working with my local copy of SQL Server local DB or the one up in Azure they're still SQL clients right so that part doesn't change it's just the actual connection string itself and then in future I can just switch which ones are commented out right so if I want to work in the local copy of the database no problem I can do that if I want to switch and work in the one in the cloud I can do that once you open the firewall we can actually run this locally in local host on my machine but still be working with the data up on Azure okay now I'm pretty sure we should be done here in Azure we are okay so we're, we're finished we rolled out our database uh, by the way they call each of these a blade right so you see you'll you'll go in and there's blades and then if I click certain things it'll open up a new blade and so on and you can scroll back and forth between it but most everything I need is right here so see up at the top it says set fire server firewall I'll do that first of all firewall settings so it shows me my client IP address right now is right here so I can just copy it that's the IP address for the college to the outside world so I'll come down and make a rule name I mean just call it college and there's always a start and an end IP but if you only have a single one just put the same value in both right so I'm just saying I'm gonna allow IP address between this one and that one to access through the firewall so I have to click Save right to actually save that one and there we go successfully updated the firewall rules so you can add more but I, I don't know what my IP address is at home off the top of my head so when I get home I'll just log into Azure and I'll add that one and that way I can connect to my database from home as well so it's pretty much as simple as that adding the firewall rules by the way I noticed if you have the latest servant uh, version of SQL Server Management Studio you can actually uh, try to connect and it'll come up and say oh we're being blocked by the server's firewall if you're logged into Azure uh, then you can actually open it and you can do it right there in, inside the dialog box where you're logging into SQL Server Management Studio they've added that as one of the newest features okay so as I said this I uh, click to copy they have these all the time up in here so that's the actual address of the server on the internet right so if I come into and I already opened it earlier SQL Server Management Studio look familiar right let me just get this guy out of the way so if I connect here to a database engine I just paste in that address right I select SQL Server authentication I put in that admin username and password by the way in the real world for real clients you would probably you wouldn't use the admin account inside Visual Studio you'd create a separate login account in SQL Server and so on and maybe an application level account things like that and use it but for what we're doing just using the admin account is totally fine server admin and my password that I put in and connect and there we go so I'm actually connected to my server up in the cloud right but it works just like any other database server okay now of course it's empty so there's no tables here other than the built-in ones the system tables and so on and so forth there's no user tables been created yet but I'm gonna leave this open because we're gonna do that in just a minute right okay another thing here connection strings so I can show the connection string or just copy it but I'm going to show you that 
you have connection string here it shows you how to connect to this server from PHP or Java or whatever technology you're using for the most part. So ADO.net is what I want. So I'm going to copy that. Let me just get Notepad up here. Good old Notepad. And uh, oh, let me just make this font a little bigger so you can see from the back of the room better. And I should also turn on Word Wrap. There we go. So that's what it looks like, right? So you know, it basically is the TCP uh, connection, right? Going to my catalog is the name of the database. So it's pretty similar, but notice we have a user ID and password. So I actually have to replace that with the ones that I'm actually using, right? So other than that, this is ready to go. So server admin. And I might do the uh, password off screen, sorry. <laughs> Okay, so that's ready to go. I'll just copy that because I'm going to use it in Visual Studio. Okay, so I'll just leave this alone. I can close that for now. I don't need that right now. Okay, so coming down here then, what I'll do is I'll paste that in here. Uh, hang on. Okay, so I now have that in as the active connection string. So I'll just save and close my web config. So let's come into our package manager console and we're going to do a update database. Would have been faster to type it. There we go. And if all goes well, which I think it will, there we go. All right. So we've applied all of our migrations, ran the seed method, and sure enough, if I come back here, where I'm connected to my cloud database, if I just do a refresh, then now I have my doctor patient tables. Notice we even have the migration history created because we can connect it to this. I could make a change to a class, add a new migration, update database, right? I just want to make sure to keep them in sync. If I do do that, that I come back in here switch which ones are commented out in my web config and make sure I also update my lo local copy. It's up to me to manually make sure my local uh, database is in sync with the changes I make in the one up in the cloud, right? Otherwise, if I try to switch back and forth later on, I'll get into trouble. <laughs> but of course, it always warns me, gives me that error message saying, oh, your database is out of sync, right? And just run update database and away you go. All right, so that's good. So, so far, so good. Let's get back to the PowerPoint. So that was step one. We create our firewall rules. We have our connection string. We've actually used it now. And we put it in our web config file. Okay, we're ahead of the game. From now on, we can switch between them. Uh, just be careful. So now we ran our package manager console. We did our update database. And just always be thinking about which one you're actually connecting to, right? Especially if you eventually get to the stage where you roll out this application and people are using it, right? Then if you're messing around, <laughs> you don't want to go in and change data that's up there live and people are actually accessing. You want to do any changes you make on the local copy and then make sure they're working, validate everything, then switch over, update the database and do whatever changes you need online. All right, step three. Now we'll make the web application. This, I kind of like doing it back in Azure again because it never fails this way and it makes it easy to publish as well. So we're gonna go to the portal, we'll create a web app, okay? Points from this PowerPoint slide before I, we leave it. Uh, the name we give must be unique and becomes a subdomain of .azurewebsites.net. Now, yeah, if you have your own domain, you can use it. Uh, I'm not sure, I've never tried using it on the free tier, whether you're allowed to, I think you might be. Um, but in any case, they provide this. And I, you know, if you get used to the Azure websites.net, it's not all that bad. <laughs> you know, obviously for production, you might want to switch it out. Uh, the name does not have to be the same name as the project. It could be anything you want, right? It's what name you want it to have up there on the internet itself, right? Uh, we'll be asked about resource again. And just make sure that whatever you create, the service plan is in the right location again. That's just a word of caution. So back to the portal. I'm going to make something else new now. So I will make a new web app, okay? 
All right, so this is the name for it. So, I don't know, a suitable name might be medical office or something like that. Uh, um, med office. Oh, I can see it lets you know whether it's unique or not. So I have a check mark, so I can use that. No one else is using that right now. Uh, it's under my Imagine account. Uh, resource group. Uh, I will create a new, I'll just call it RG for resource group. Now for the service plan and location, okay. Oh. Okay. Okay. Oh, well, I'll just use existing. Yeah. Sorry. There we go. My apologies. I am recording, right? Double check. Yep. Okay. Medical office resource group. I'll use the existing. That's what I meant to do anyway. I don't know what I was thinking. So look at this. It wants to use a South Central U.S. No, we're going to create a new service plan, and I'll call it. Med office SP for service plan. And I'll make sure I put the location again, Canada East, right? So it's in the same locale as everything else to do with this application. I can pin it to dashboard and create. So when it's done, this will make, this is quicker because it's just an empty web app. It'll just make the web app itself, but there's nothing in it, right? It doesn't have any files actually in it. Well, it has a skeleton, one or two web pages, just to say like under construction, something like that. Now, I've already pinned it to dashboard, so that's good. Okay, so here's the URL. I can click on the URL. It'll go and open it in a browser. It says your app has been created. Oh, here's, oh gosh, they've added a video. That's new since I was last here. Uh, deep dive into Azure App Services. There you go. So there's some stuff uh, right up on our website, but it, it's waiting for us to actually upload our own, right? Okay, uh, what else I could point out here, uh, you can set up FTP, right? So if you want to use FTP to send your, all your files up, you're welcome to do so. But publishing is much better, it works much more easily uh, than FTP. So you can get the published profile here, download that and use it in Visual Studio. But actually it's even easier than that. You know, you don't really need, even need to do that. This is up and ready to go, so all I have to do is come back to Visual Studio Oh, I guess I should bring my PowerPoint slide up because, okay, so publish the app. So back in Visual Studio, now we made the app. We're going to make sure we're signed in with the same Microsoft account that we're using, right? That's something I haven't done yet. And then make sure our connection string is the one pointing to the, our database in the cloud, right? So maybe I'll do those first. Come back here. Oh, no, I'm not logged. I'm logged in as Niagara College, right? That's not good. So let's come down here to account settings. I'll sign out there and then I'll sign in. I'll sign in with my same demo student. So you would use your Microsoft account you've created and verified. Outlook.com. Password. See if I messed that up or not. Oh, seems to have gotten through. And there we go. So now I'm logged into Visual Studio with that account. That's important because my Azure account uses this account and now they can talk to each other. So I'll just close. And all we really have to do, there's several ways to get to it. It's under the project menu, but I usually just right click up here and select publish. Opens this little blade here for the solution. Uh, there's overview, connected services, and publish, right? So here's where you'd go as well if you were following any of the new tutorials on how to do it all from Visual Studio. You can create a new and go through all the steps. But since we have everything in place, I just do select existing, right? It's so right down here, select existing. When I click publish, it comes up here, okay, based on my account, what can we publish to? Well, here's my subscription, resource groups, Okay, and here we go. There's my medical office resource group, and there's my med office web application. So that's it. I just click OK, and now it's publishing. So the first time it takes the longest, right, because nothing's up there yet. But, you know, every time you make a little change, you just publish again, and it'll be very, very quick because it only has to send up changes, differences, you know, files that have been modified. So here it is. It all, when it's finished publishing, it'll open the website in a browser. It'll open the website in a browser. 
You'll find that when you have a site up in Azure, uh, if you haven't been there in a while, you go to it, it takes a little while to spool up. Because on the free tier, it kind of lets it go to sleep, right? Uh, but once it's up and running, actually, performance, even on the free tier, is actually very, very good. Usually the first time you bring up any page, okay, it, it does a lot of caching to help things. So the first time, nothing's cached. So it can take a little while to even bring up my doctor list, even though it's quite short, and so on. But of course, we can use different tabs, get things going on at once. So there's my doctors, there's my patients. Remember, this is all we did. I've got my paging down here. We have our filter search. This is just how we left it uh, when we were done, right? But now it's live up online. Let me just point out, because it's azurewebsites.net and they have their own very secure certificate, if you want, you can go HTTPS, right? And you get the little green, you're all good, right? So you have a fully secure connection that's available. Just hosting it with azurewebsites.net. Uh, I'll share it with you later. There's a snippet of code you can put in your global ASAX file, which is the global file that gets run every time the application loads, that just redirects if any requests come in that aren't encrypted, that aren't HTTPS, it just reroutes them through that. And it's automatically switch your, your URL over. So it's very, very easy to then have it up and running, secure, and fully encrypted. Right? So there we go. So that's it. That's all there is to publishing. Uh, let me just, I'll leave it up here for a second. Let's just uh, go back to Visual Studio. Let's just make a quick little change. If I come down here, the most obvious place I can think of is our home index. No, don't show again, thank you. Oh, I've got all, let me just make more room. Okay, all right, right here. Okay, Dave was here, so I'll just click publish again, and it'll be very quick this time, right, because there's very little changes, but now, no, I don't want to update Firefox, thank you. <laughs> there we go. So you see how quick it is, you know, whether it's a small change or a significant change, just make your changes, click publish, every, it's like clicking save, but you're actually publishing it right up to Azure every time you do so, right, so there you go. So now you can start doing all, and I'll even have an option for some of your project work to submit it by posting it in Azure. I'll just go and look at it there, okay? I'll probably still in some cases ask for some of the code as well that I can check your code in addition, but you know, you should start learning, uh, getting comfortable with Azure for sure. Any questions about that? All right, so that's basically it. So, oh, here's a good tip. I almost forgot I threw this in at the last minute. If you move from one computer to another, so you take it home, and you go to click publish, eh, you're gonna get a prompt coming up saying asking for a password. Guess what? You don't know that password. I don't know that password. Okay, you'd have to phone Bill Gates and ask him for that password. It, it gets generated by the system and stored in those published profiles, right? So here's the simple trick, right? Save you an hour of Googling to try and find out how do I get around this password. All you do is you go into your properties, and there, whether you do it in the file system or right in Visual Studio, under properties, you'll find a folder called Publish Profiles. Just delete it. That's it. All you have to do is delete that, and then you follow the same steps we just did, and that way you can go from one computer to another, and it just creates a new, downloads the Publish Profile over again, containing the password. Right? It's just a security thing, I guess. It, that way, somebody couldn't take your source code and keep publishing from some other computer somewhere, right? It basically can tell that it's not the same computer, and so it prompts for the password, right? Okay, so that's the final tip. So again, don't panic. Azure is fun too. <laughs> I'll just show you where that is, just so you know. Uh, you can get it right here under properties, right at the top. Just publish profiles, you just delete that folder, or in the file system, you can do it there as well. So here I am, I go into medical office, properties, there's publish profiles. Just delete that folder, I'll do it. There we go. Now when I go to publish, actually, I'm not sure what that would do. I always do it this way. Uh, just select publish here, and then it comes up with this page again because there's no publish profile, right? So you just do select existing and go through those steps again. So I'm simulating what it would be like to do it from a separate computer, right? 
and now it's publishing away. It was smart enough to go and check, oh, I don't have to send everything, right? It just figured out what it had to send. All right, that's it, I'm done. Any questions?